I teach uh, mostly, although not exclusively, intellectual property courses, by which I mean I teach copyright, uh, I teach patent and trademark. So let me try to explain a little bit about um, those subjects, just briefly. And then I wanted to go through some text written by Thomas Jefferson to a, a gentleman named Isaac McPherson, um, which I think is really interesting because it shows the founder of this university thinking very hard about the subject that I teach about, intellectual property. Thomas Jefferson's at the intellectual root of a lot of things, and oddly, and to my delight, he's at the intellectual root of what I do, um, which makes it kind of fun to be here. So, okay, patents, copyright, trademark. Um, what are these things about? Let me start with patents, um, probably the most familiar to you. A patent is a legal right that is created um, in the United States for um, scientific and technical inventions that are novel, that are non-obvious, and that are useful, okay, and that are adequately described in a patent application. So you bring a patent application to the Patent and Trademark Office in DC, and you show them that this invention you're claiming, maybe this composition of matter, or this process, or this business method, is a new thing, right? It's not anticipated, it hasn't been seen under the sun before. Um, it's non-obvious, right? It's not an obvious step from anything that's been seen by people before, and it's useful, right? It, it satisfies some human need. So a new molecule, for example, that might be useful to treat a disease, this is a kind of canonical thing that you might be able to patent. If it hasn't actually been seen before, it hasn't been patented before, or described in the literature, or disclosed at an academic conference, or something along those lines, um, it is potentially novel. Um, it's potentially also non-obvious if it's not readily deducible from things that already exist and that we know about. And if it is useful, as I posited, to treat this human disease, then it it's clearly has the kind of utility that patent cares about. So if, in fact, um, you do have a patentable piece of subject matter, like a new composition of matter, in my example, a new molecule that has some therapeutic effect, you bring it to the Patent and Trademark Office, you describe to them why you think it's novel and useful and non-obvious, and if they are convinced by this, they grant you a set of rights that lasts for 20 years from the date of the grant, and basically these rights give you the exclusive right within the territory of the U.S. to make, to use, to sell, to import this patented thing. Right now you can see that might be very valuable. Why might that be very valuable? Because if you have the exclusive right to make, to use, to sell, to import this patented thing, um, you don't have competitors in the provision of this patented thing, and that means that you're going to be able to actually reap, um, if this thing is valuable, some monopoly profits. You're going to be able to charge a higher price because you don't have competitors competing with you um, in the provision of this thing that you've patented. Okay, so that's patent. Copyright. Closely related to patent. Um, copyright is a body of law that exists to grant exclusive rights in certain authors of original artistic and literary works. Okay, so whereas patent covers scientific and technological inventions, copyright covers artistic and literary works, so books, movies, poems, sculptures, oil paintings, computer programs, right? That, that seems a little odd maybe at first blush, um, but it's, it's true, it's covered by copyright, the graphic arts, right? So all these types of artistic and literary subject matter covered by copyright. To get a copyright is a lot easier than getting a patent. You don't have to go and apply for one. If I sit down with one of you for a beer and I sketch you on a cocktail napkin, the minute I lift my sketch, I've got a copy, the minute I lift my pen, I'm sorry, I've got a copyright in my sketch. Why is that? Copyright arises more or less automatically and indiscriminately the minute that I fix a creative work in a tangible medium. Is the work creative? Yeah, it might be bad. I'm not a particularly good artist, but it's at least creative. It's original to me. I didn't copy it from someone. Is it fixed in a tangible medium? Yeah, it's fixed in the cocktail napkin, right? I've sketched it on the cocktail napkin. Not a great tangible medium for artistic purposes, but certainly good enough for copyright purposes. So I fixed a creative work in a tangible medium. I lift my pen. Copyright arises. Now what does this give me? This gives me, believe it or not, um, rights to make exclusive rights to make copies, to make works based on my copyrighted work, right? So if I wanted to create an oil painting based on my sketch, I'd have the exclusive right to do that. You couldn't do it without my permission. I have the exclusive right to distribute this work, right, in copies. I have um, the exclusive right 
to publicly display this work, right? So I have a bundle of exclusive rights that I get by virtue of the copyright, and they last a long time. They last at the moment until I drop dead, and then 70 years thereafter, right? So if it turns out that for some who knows what reason my sketch has some value, it's not just I that will be enjoying the value, it's my heirs, right? And how I feel about that depends on how I feel about my heirs on the day when you ask me the question. At the moment, my heirs seem okay, but that could change. My heirs are 10 and 8, so <laughs> my, my mood about them vacillates. Um, okay, so this is the copyright law, and um, the copyright law and the patent law are alike in one very important way, um, and that is what they're there to do, right? So typically when I teach, um, this is a mock class. Um, I'm doing a lot of talking. I, n I wouldn't typically do this much talking. I typically would ask questions, and students would do the talking. I don't really know any of your names. It makes it difficult to ask questions. It's polite to point and say you. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll look for some volunteers and, you know, there's no, um, well, there may be stupid questions, but there are no stupid answers, right? Um, so, um, do any of you have in mind an idea of what these patent and copyright laws are there to do? Right? Why do we have them? Why do we have property rights in these things? Yes? They're there to encourage further creativity. Yeah, so um, here's the theory. Um, actually, there's a very odd thing. Um, it's written into our Constitution. So if you look at Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which I have up here on the board, this is the part of the Constitution that sets out what are referred to as Congress's enumerated powers. Right? So we, we have a democracy where um, at least the theory was in the Constitution that we would set up certain powers that the federal legislature had. Our federal legislature isn't supposed to have every power under the sun. It's supposed to only have powers that are enumerated for it, right? So this is one of the most important parts of the Constitution, at least in theory and at least at the beginning, this is the part of the Constitution that was supposed to delineate what the powers of the federal legislature were, right? And given that the framers thought that if there was going to be tyranny, it would most likely come from the legislature, this was something they wanted to be pretty careful about, right? So um, it starts out, the Congress shall have the power to, right? And then there's a list of things that the Congress has the power to do, right? To lay in collect taxes, duties, imposts, excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare, right? So there's a list of things. Um, to borrow money on the credit of the United States, to regulate commerce with foreign nations, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get this power that's very relevant to patents and copyrights, the things that I just discussed. The Congress shall have power to, and here's the language. Let me see if I can highlight it. I bet I can to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Right, so there's a lot of really interesting and strange stuff going on in this enumerated power given to Congress. One of the things that's going on here is that these exclusive rights given to authors, that is copyright, and inventors, that is patent, um, these exclusive rights are tied to a particular purpose, and that's the purpose you articulated, to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Right? We're going to allow Congress, we're not going to require Congress to do this. If Congress doesn't want to do it, they don't have to. We're just going to give the Congress the power, if they want, to create laws that create limited time exclusive rights that can't last forever, exclusive rights given to authors and inventors, not to publishing companies, not to um, Merck, a drug company, but to the actual inventor of something or the author of a work. Um, and the rights are to their writings, that is the kind of stuff you copyright. A photograph can be copyrighted, it's been interpreted to be a writing, it's a weird kind of writing, but it's a writing under, at least under the logic of the law. And discoveries, right, the drug molecule that I posited in my hypothetical. Okay, so how do these rights, what's the theory of how they promote progress in science and the useful arts? Odd thing, by science, the framers meant knowledge, by which they meant copyright. And by useful arts, they meant machines, by which they meant patent. Right, so the word arts seems weird in there, but they meant art as in like artifice, right? Not as in art like, you know, art school. Um, so um, what's the theory by which the existence of these property rights promotes progress. Yes? Yeah, so it's, it's like bait, right? You hang out some bait. 
Um, what happens if there's no exclusive rights? What happens if, and again, this is all theory now. We're not talking about reality yet. Um, we'll talk about whether this maps on really well to reality. But what, at least by the theory you just articulated, would happen in a world where I wrote a book and there were no copyrights? There were instead either no rules at all or a rule that allowed anyone who wished to to copy my work and distribute copies of my work. So the effective equivalent of today, the music industry. <laughs> it would be, you might think it would be, I mean, it's going to be hard for me to sell my book and make a living as a writer. It's going to be difficult. And the reason it's going to be difficult is because in order to come up with the first book, right, in order to write the book that you want to write, the first copy of the book, you've got to put in, you know, pro probably thousands of hours of your labor, right? And that labor represents a cost to you, both in terms of, you know, the, the value of your labor and, you know, the, the value of the opportunities you give up. So that cost is borne by you. And then, you know, after you produce the first copy of the book, right, you've written your book and you've made a co first copy, um, it's actually pretty cheap to produce the second copy, the third copy, the fifth copy, the tenth copy, the nth copy, right? It's cheaper to copy than it is to produce for the first time. And so the people who might want to copy your book don't bear the costs of creation that you bear. And as a result, they may be able to outcompete you in the provision of the book to the public because they don't need to recover those costs. If they're allowed to compete with you, the worry is, and again, this is theory, if they're allowed to compete with you, the worry is that they will outcompete you. They will deny you the ability to re recover your costs. Because you're smart, you'll have figured that out in advance, and you'll desist from engaging in the creative practice to begin with. Right? So this is a, this is, the theory here is a theory of market failure. That without controls on copying, copying leads to market failure. Which market? The market for new creativity. And we'll get, the theory goes, this kind of systematic under-provision of creative works in a world where um, copyists are free to copy. Okay, so that's, this is the world seen from the perspective of, you know, 2010, right? Now, the, mm, there's some issues with this when we try to map this onto the way the world works, but this is at least the theory. I want to go back now. Um, and I want to think a bit about um, Jefferson's approach to this, because so much of this came from him. But before I do, I just want to talk at least for a moment about trademark. Patent and copyright are alike in this way. They're both, the, they're both posited as this kind of inducement mechanisms, at least in American law. This is the way we predominantly think about them. The Europeans have a somewhat different perspective on this, but um, maybe we can talk about that later if we have some time. Um, Trademark is different, right? Trademark is not like patent and copyright. So um, who's wearing Nikes? Anyone wearing Nikes? Okay, so what, what's on your shoe that distinguishes it as a Nike? It's a swoosh, right? It's that mark, that, that um, swoosh-shaped mark, right? And that's a very famous mark. So what is it there to do, right? Why does Nike put the swoosh on their shoes? Yeah, and why, why are they more valuable with the swoosh on them? I mean, the swoosh is attractive, but what's the real reason, or at least, you know, it is to me. What, what's the real reason that the swoosh is on there? Yeah, so when you walk in to a store to buy sneakers, um, what Nike wants and what Adidas wants and what Reebok wants and what every branded manufacturer wants is they want you to be able readily to identify their product. And the, the, the trademark is kind of a symbolic shorthand by which you identify their product. To the extent that you've had positive experiences with that product in the past, or friends or acquaintances of yours have had positive experiences and have communicated them to you, you start to associate those positive experiences with this symbol, right? The trademark is a tool that firms use to associate the goodwill that you might feel about the product with the source of the product, that is the company that makes these Nike shoes. Um, this is not not an inducement to engage in creative effort. This is a kind of efficiency tool. This is a tool that lowers your search costs, right? allows you to find what you want quicker, and that facilitates competition, right? because these marks tend to be associated with certain product attributes, and if those product attributes are the ones you're looking for, the mark is like a map that leads you to the product attributes you're looking for. Right? So this is a kind of consumer protection, consumer search cost tool. This is not an inducement to 
creativity. So trademark kind of stands aside. Um, and again, I really want to focus on copyright and patent. So let's, let's do it through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Um, and to do so, I want to turn to a very curious letter that he wrote in 1813 to an acquaintance of his, Isaac McPherson, who was someone who was quite concerned with progress, progress in science and in the arts. And Isaac McPherson had written to Jefferson basically asking what he thought about the patent system, right, and what he called monopolies in creative goods. And um, Jefferson writes back, and it, it's, it's a it's a kind of essentially Jeffersonian letter. It's, it's, it's so beautiful in many ways, the way he writes. There are phrases in there that kind of make you forget about the subject matter sometimes. Um, and he, he wrote you know, two or three of these every day, right? He was, he was incredibly prolific. Um, so what I'd like to do is what we often do in law school. We go through some piece of text very closely, and we try to unpack the ideas. Because you'll see if we unpack this piece of text, a whole bunch of things spring out of it um, that are in our day and age, kind of modern understandings of intellectual property, its role, its benefits and drawbacks, um, that are presaged in this letter from 1813. So let me read a bit and then let me ask some questions. It has been pretended by some, and in England especially, that inventors have a natural and exclusive right to their inventions, and not merely for their own lives, but inheritable to their heirs. Okay, so what is he talking about there? He's talking about, and this is the question he's going to address, um, our inventions, right, and by which he meant patentable stuff, but this also applies to copyrightable stuff, are they the subject of property in their inventors or creators just by force of some natural law, right? So um, let me give you an example of what he was thinking about. Um, if you make a table, right, do you own that table? And the answer typically is yes, right? And by, you know, by the rules that we typically think of as being standard rules of property, you own that table in perpetuity. And when you pass on, it passes to your heirs through the, you know, through your will or through the probate system, or it, it goes on. Stable ownership goes on and on through the generations. The table never becomes unowned. Right? Contrast that with a book, right, or a drug. You invent a drug, you don't own it under our system until you get a patent in it. You may or may not get a patent in it. And even if you do, you only own it for 20 years and then it becomes public property. Right? What about a book? Well, I write a book. Um, the copyright's relatively easy to get, but after my death, 70 years elapses, the book reverts to the public. It becomes part of the public domain. Right? So ownership of a book or of a molecule is not the same as ownership of a table. So why this difference? Right? That's the question that he was trying to address. Because at first it seems kind of odd. Why these different forms of ownership? Okay, so here's, here's the way he goes about it. But while it is a moot question, whether the origin of any kind of property is derived from nature at all, it would be singular, right, to admit a natural and even a hereditary right to inventors. It is agreed by those who have seriously considered the subject that no individual has of natural right a separate property in an acre of land, for instance. By a universal law, indeed, whatever, whether fixed or movable, belongs to all men equally and in common is the property for the moment of him who occupies it. But when he relinquishes the occupation, the property goes with it. And here's the key sentence. Stable ownership, stable ownership is the gift of social law and is given late in the progress of society. Stable ownership is the gift of social law and is given late in the progress of society. What is that sentence saying? This, this is the sentence, the first kind of fulcrum in this letter around which his theory of property turns. So stable property is the gift of social law and is given late in the progress of society. What is he talking about there? Where does property come from? Yes. The social contract. 
Well, maybe, right? Maybe the social contract, um, the idea that people come together in a society and they give up their natural freedom based on some understandings about what the arrangements will be. But I don't think Jefferson really was contractarian in that sense. I think he was being pragmatic here. I think he was saying, what he was saying is more a positivist account that the law, right, creates property arrangements. The property arrangements don't proceed from kind of universal principles of justice. They don't come from God, right? They don't necessarily come from some kind of mythical social contract. Instead, they can be described by the law, right? By what people decide just or efficient property relationships should be, right? And this is, this is a social consensus that we arrive at through the machinery of government, right? Stable property, that is property that lasts longer than you can defend whatever piece of land you're sitting on, is the gift of social law and is given late in the progress of society. Okay, so here's where he turns this observation to IP. Okay, and th th this is, the, to me, the elegance of this letter. It would be curious, then, if an idea, the fugitive fermentation of an individual brain, could of natural right be claimed in exclusive and stable property. If nature has made any one thing less susceptible than all others is of exclusive property, it is the action of the thinking power called an idea, which an individual may exclusively possess as long as he keeps it to himself. But the moment it is divulged, it forces itself into the possession of everyone, and the receiver cannot dispossess himself of it. Here's the sentence I want you to think about. Its peculiar character, too, is that no one possesses the less because every other possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. Right? There's the image. Right? You have a candle, and your friend comes up with an unlit candle, and you light your friend's unlit candle. Your friend's candle ignites. Your candle does not extinguish. Right? Where we had one lit candle, now we have two. And this to Jefferson is absolutely key. Right? So why is it key? That's, that's what he says ideas are like. If I have an idea and I communicate it to you, the idea does not leak out of my head. It's still there. But you also have it. And if you communicate that idea to ten other people, they have it too. Right? They spread without ever diminishing. Why is that key to Jefferson? Think about the table that I described to you earlier versus the idea. What's the difference? Yes? Uh, with the table, well, one ages and it can be damaged, so over time an idea remains the same, but there's also no like interconnection, which, or less interconnection, I'm sure there's some, um, between the development of table and the development of, say, another similar table. But an idea can spark an idea in someone else that would well, that's interesting. You, the, the, the theory there is that tables are productive, right? Uh, I'm sorry, that ideas are productive and that they spark ideas in others, whereas tables are just kind of tables, right? So we, we can talk about that, but let, do you own a table? Yeah, how many people can sit around the table? Six. Okay, so six. Um, so do you have an idea? Have you had one in the past? How many people could own that idea? Well, it's a hard question though, right? And I think what Jefferson is saying is, you know, the table um, is, and here's the economics term, rivalrous. Right? Most forms of property are rivalrous. If I'm using the table, other people may not be able to use the table. If I'm using the laptop, other people may not be able to use the laptop, right? M most ordinary goods are like that. If I'm chewing gum, it's hard for you to chew that piece of gum, right? I mean, you can, people have to be quite close to share gum, right? So it's, it's gum is highly rivalrous. Um, you know, ideas are not rivalrous. And that makes a huge difference, a huge difference to the economics of ideas versus the economics of tables. Why? Well, because the idea is not rivalrous, you can keep spreading it without excluding people from it. 
right? Rivalrous goods like laptops or gum are scarce. Scarce, right? They're scarce because, by hypothesis, a rivalrous good can't be, you know, costlessly shared, right? And so, because rivalrous goods are scarce, we have a market in them. Why do we have a market in them? To allocate rivalrous goods that are scarce according to some logic, right? The logic of markets is allocate according to willingness to pay, right? That may be fair, that may be unfair, but that's what markets are there to do. They're there to allocate scarce rivalrous goods according to willingness to pay. Now what Jefferson's saying is, well, wait a minute. If the good's not rivalrous, it's not scarce. Once some, someone comes up with an idea, right, you can spread it ad infinitum. The idea never gets any worse. It just gets more widely understood. It's not rivalrous. Because it's not rivalrous, it's not scarce once we have the idea. And because it's not scarce, we don't need a market in it. We don't need to allocate according to willingness to pay. The best way to allocate ideas in the abstract is by spreading them as much as you can. That's the progress of science and useful arts. Hang on one second. And by spreading them as much as you can, um, you don't need a market. And if you don't need a market, you don't need property rights. But that's the difference between the table and the idea. So why would we have property rights? Right, we do have property rights and ideas. Why would we have them? Well, Jefferson gets to that too. Inventions, he says, and I'm starting here. Inventions, then, cannot in nature be a subject of property. Right? There's no natural property right in an invention, he says. But, but society may give an exclusive right to the profits arising from them as an encouragement to men, right, men, I mean women too, I guess, but you know, he wasn't that concerned with it, as an encouragement to men to pursue ideas which may produce utility, right? This is starting to sound like the patent system. But this may or may not be done according to the will and convenience of the society without claim or complaint from anybody. Right? So we might have a patent system, we might not have a patent system. What, why would we make the choice to have a patent system or a copyright system for that matter? If we think that we need to spur people to creative effort, we might give some um, period during which they ex enjoy exclusively the profits from that creative effort so that they can get back their investment. Right? But that's not, it's not a moral issue, that's just an issue of expediency. We might want to do that, we might not want to do that, depending on whether we think it's going to work and whether we think it's worth the effort. Right, so why might it not be worth the effort? Right, so Jefferson has a concern, and this comes from the history in England, right, where patents were granted by the Crown, and copyrights were granted to something called the Stationers Company, which was a kind of cartel of publishers. Copyrights were often used as a tool to suppress speech that was um, hostile to the government. Um, and patents were often used to favor politically connected groups, right? These are monopolies. And they might be used productively to encourage wide investment and participation in new creative works. Or they might be used badly to protect favored monopolies to suppress speech, right? So what Jefferson's getting at, I think, ultimately is, well, these things can be useful, but they also can be kind of hot potatoes. And uh, before we start employing them, we want to think pretty hard about it, right? That's, I think, the reason why, um, written into the Constitution, you get a power in Congress to do this if Congress wishes to do it, but some limits on what Congress can do. Only limited time, rights, only given to authors and inventors, not to powerful intermediaries like publishing companies or guilds. And for the purpose of promoting the progress in science and useful arts, not for the purpose of protecting somebody's market position or um, favoring uh, a certain constituency, a political constituency that you want to favor. Right? So this is at least, I think, the hope of the Patent and Copyright Clause as it was inserted into the Constitution. Now, if we had a lot more time, I could explain to you how those limitations have become mostly toothless, right? How the courts have ignored them um, and allowed Congress, for various reasons, to kind of run amok um, and create patent and copyright laws that do some of the things that Jefferson was afraid um, that they might do.
uh, if they were turned to some uh, undesirable ends, but that, that's another story for another day. 